Well, today we're going to feast. So it makes sense that we talk about feasting. And it's pausing for a topical sermon, although when we resume and get back into the book of Matthew, you'll find that we're about to be at a particular feast, about to have the Passover feast as part of Scripture. So I We're going to go over a little bit of the feasts in the Bible and some other things as well. So it it does tie in, as as all good sermons and scriptures should, amen? And we're going to talk about that. I was actually looking, I I stumbled onto this page of, it's like the 10 most expensive meals you can eat in the world today. Some are like, like we're talking like meals that were $300,000 per plate, uh, in fact, it was what, the ones that still stuck to mind as I was looking, I was showing Catherine a few of them. And a lot of gold leaf works in. There was, I believe there was a $3,000 pizza that had gold leaf and lobster and caviar. I, I, <laughs> and that's what we're having today after service. <laughs> And, and I believe there was also a hamburger that was $500, uh, $500. No, 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 $2,500, sorry. $2,500 hamburger. You get it at the Mandalay Bay next time you're in Vegas. I believe, so it's, it's like a pound of Wagyu beef and like, and, and like truffles that are $1,500 per pound. And it's just prepared and, and probably some gold leaf. I don't know. I, I don't get the gold leaf thing, but... I guess if you're that rich, you want to eat. Well, in, in, the, in Jesus' day, in the first century, the Romans were actually well-known, famous for their fantastic feasting. In the first century, Emperor Vitellius produced an enormous platter called the Shield of Minerva. That's a nice, nice plate. You just sort of turn the shield over. It included pike livers, pheasant and peacock brains, flamingo tongues, lamprey spleens, and other luxury ingredients gathered from all corners. The point was it was gathered from all corners of the empire. We fast forward to the medieval times, and there were a lot of feasts that were had as well. In fact, they would have the feast, and they would also have diversions at the feast called subtleties. Servants would wheel in mechanical elephants, ships, and castles, so you had this fanfare that would go with it, troubadours providing music, fireworks in the sky. Or when you think of a feast, it's, there's fanfare around the feast too, right? Sometimes entertainment appeared in the form of huge pies. Inside the pies, it was at the Duke of Burgundy's Feast of the Pheasant. And they, there was a, this was 1484. They made a pie so big that, you know what, burst out of it? The entire band of musicians that were performing. Uh, and you, like, the feasts of the old days, right? The feasts of yore, they were, like, they were done, like there was no refrigeration. They were created by hand with no modern tools. Food had to be collected and transported. And a lot of these feasts would be last days. So not only did the guests have to be fed for several days, but then so did the servants. It was at, at Archbishop Neville's enthronement feast in 1465, 62 cooks catered for over 900 guests plus the servants. The the cooking required months of planning, cooking pots so large some needed ropes and pulleys to empty them, and even an empty copper saucepan could weigh 40 pounds. So these cooking stations were so, and they, they, often you would have outdoor feasts. Also you'd have a lot of embellishment, sugar sculpting came into play, then reached its zenith in the 18th century. That's entirely, that's entirely sugar. We, I, I didn't let the kids are out of the room, thankfully. They would just they would want and expect this when they get home, right? A, a 1693 engraving shows a table laid for 60 guests with sugar sculptures three feet high in front of every place setting, almost obscuring the food from view. Now we we see a lot of this, and I think as Christians we react with a certain way that, and I'm not saying it's inappropriate, Christians today, we have a curious relationship when it comes to feasting. Like I get already here in the room, it's like, what a, gold, like we're, what a, what a waste of money. What a, what a gluttonous indulgence. And yet it's okay, to, like Scripture talks about, we're going to get into feasting in Scripture here in just a moment. So the question is, that it could be gluttonous, it can be overindulgent. But if, so if we, if we make sure it's not gluttonous, we don't overindulge and don't overspend if it's reasonably priced, like, well then, but do we still then just enjoy it like the world does? Right? 
A lot of times we have, we, we think of terms like church, but then we take all, all our other stuff is compartmentalized, right? Or going to the movies or, or sitting down to the meal, a feast with family. We don't want to feast just like the world does. We don't just want, oh, I, I feast minus the sinful parts. Well, that's still, that's still worldly. Where is God in the picture, right? 1 Corinthians 10.31 says, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for Glory to God. So before we feast together today, I want us to have a theology of feasting. Not just, well, we feast because we have God's permission to have a nice, wonderful meal together. It's, it's something He allows us to do. Or, well, by His grace we can have it. What, no, how do we do it to His glory? What's an actual to the glory of, really and truly to the glory of God, with God in mind as we feast, with God in view as we feast, and actually enjoying it through a godly lens? So let's pray and take some time to prepare our hearts and minds before we put it into practice today. Father, we thank you this morning that we can sift your word, spend a little time together preparing our hearts as well as our bodies and our stomachs for a time of feasting today. And may it not just be something that we consume today with both, both our mouths and our minds, but, but instill in us a growing sense to take to every feast, to every meal as we Enjoy food with you in mind. I pray all this in your name. Amen. Let's start very, very simply. Chronological order. Where does feast, where do we find feast in the Bible? Where does it come into play? Who did the first feast? The first time that the word feast gets used in the Bible. Who, Who knows off the top of their head? Somebody's doing their Bible app search right now. Type in feast. Hey, I did. Oddly enough, the first time you're really going to find something the way we actually see the word get translated as feast in in a lot of your translations, oddly enough, it's Lot. Lot providing some hospitality in Genesis 19. And so the first feast we find is in Sodom. It's not as if nobody ever feasted, but when we actually first see it here, we have Genesis 19.3. I uh, start with 19 once, as the two angels entered Sodom in the evening as Lot was sitting in Sodom's gateway. When Lot saw them, he got up to meet them. He bowed with his face to the ground and said, My lords, turn aside to your servant's house, wash your feet, and spend the night. Then you can get up early and go on your way. No, they said, we'd rather spend the night in the square. Verse 3 tells us, But he urged them so strongly that they followed him and went into his house. He prepared a feast and baked unleavened bread for them, and they ate. So the first instance we actually see in Scripture, a feast is made to entertain angels, and it's done as an act of hospitality to guests, in fact, strangers. Second time, then, we see a feast, Genesis 21, we see the feast that Abraham throws when Isaac is weaned. It says, the child, Isaac, grew and was weaned, and Abraham held a great feast on the day Isaac was weaned. So here Isaac, as you remember, was promised. Abraham was told he'd have a son, that Sarah would have a child in her old age. And so they receive this child. The child is weaned. What do you do? You throw a feast. You're celebrating the gratefulness for God's provision. In this case, provision of a child. The next time, then, so we have hospitality for guests. We see gratefulness for what God has given. Then we see actually a feast turn up as a way to cement a partnership in Genesis 26, 30. And this actually then, so Abraham has Isaac, Isaac grows up, Isaac is running around in the world, he's interacting with a man, there's a story about he and Abimelech, you can read the full story at some point, but in Genesis 26, says, we have clearly seen how the Lord has been with you. This is Abimelech talking. He says, we think there should be an oath between two parties, between us and you. Let us make a covenant with you. You will not harm us, just as we have not harmed you, but have done only what was good to you, sending you away in peace. You are now blessed by the Lord. So he prepared a banquet or feast, depending on your translation, and they ate and drank. They got up early in the morning and swore an oath to each other. Isaac sent them on their way, and they left in peace." So it's actually a feast to actually be part of that ratifying of covenant relationship. And of course, when we think of covenant relationship, what do we most think of outside of relationship, covenant with God? When we think about a covenant, what's a covenant that's actually commonly shared even amongst people who don't know Christ today? 
marriage. So where's the next place that we see a feast turn up? Genesis 29, when Laban is supposed to give Jacob the wife that he was promised. There's sort of a bait and switch that happens. That's another story you can read on your own time. <laughs> but in Genesis 29, it says, Laban invited all the men of the place and sponsored a feast. And so it's basically a feast for a wedding. And these feasts, typically, we see a lot of wedding feasts would last a week. That's, nowadays, they spend, we spend a lot of money on just a few hours. Now, the next place we see then is a feast in Genesis 40 to honor service. And interestingly enough, this is by the, the Pharaoh. This is when Joseph is in Egypt, and he's actually interpreting a couple, a couple guys' dreams, the chief baker and the chief cupbearer. There's another great, to whet your appetite, this, there's a feast thrown, and one of these men is killed, and one of these men is, enjoys the feast. Um, but it says, on the third day, which is Pharaoh's birthday, he gave a feast for all his servants. He elevated the chief cupbearer and the chief baker among his servants. Some translations will say he lifted up the head of, one in recognition, one in a different way. Probably not a feast. You, if you don't know which one you are, don't go to that feast. But here you have, he throws it for his servants. It's recognizing the, both the worth of the servants and in one case, a judgment on one of them. But you have a feast to honor service and give recognition. Then we see a feast to the Lord is what Moses is telling then the Pharaoh later is why they, he needs to let the people go to worship the Lord. Moses said, we'll go with our young and our old, we'll go with our sons and our daughters and with our flocks and herds, for we must hold a feast to the Lord. So this feast is to the Lord, it's an act of worship. And in fact, then we see as we come to the Passover in Exodus 12, God says, this day shall be for you a memorial day, and you shall keep it as a feast to the Lord. Throughout your generations, it's a statute forever. You shall keep it as a feast, talking about the Passover. Of course, he brings them out of Egypt, so we see that feasts happen both as worship, but also commemorating something that God has done. This is the emergence of feasting. We actually get, and there's a whole sermon right here, but I have more. We'll, we'll reformat this, so we, we see different reasons, at least seven different reasons, and, and I want us to get to seven aims, and we'll, we'll tweak these a little bit and give us seven aims of what feasting ought to be for amongst Christians today. But before we get there, we, we, have, another, we have a few sevens today, because God then, of course, builds His people Israel, builds them into a nation, and part of the giving of His law is they are to keep some feasts. There are Old Testament feasts. Leviticus chapter 23 covers seven feasts that Israel was to keep. So we see in the emergence chronologically, just in our scriptures, of, of how we see feasts are happening, whether they're from the people of God or not, all with some reasons that aren't pretty good. In Leviticus chapter 23, God then tells the people of Israel to keep four in the spring, three in the fall. And, and we actually see that they, they meant something to the people then. And as Christians, we actually understand, as, as Jesus said, He came not to abolish the law, but to do what? To fulfill it. That these feasts, in many ways, point to and show us something about Christ. And not all of them are feasts in the way that we would think of feasts. You'll see that here in a minute, too. Feasts in this, the way it's used here in, in the in the Old Testament, this language can just mean appointed times. So God's saying you're going to keep these feasts or these appointed occasions. They're not, they're not all celebrating with food as most of us would think about a feast today. But again, they've got a commemorative element, but also a foreshadowing element. And the first one we've already mentioned, right? God commissioned the Passover, the Passover feast. Celebrating the Passover, of the angel of death over the homes of the Israelites when they were in Egypt. And we'll see that Jesus was attending the Passover feast, and then He goes to the garden, and then He's arrested. So that's right at the time of Passover that's being established. So we see it was established with God's people in Egypt, and it's kept all the way up to we see then Jesus is celebrating it with His disciples. And this feast then, as Jesus will illustrate, 
showing that He is ultimately the Passover lamb. That His blood, like the Passover lamb's blood that was painted on the doorpost, His blood would be shed, and He's actually crucified then during this time when Passover was being observed. A lamb without blemish or defect it called for. Because His life was completely free of sin, He becomes that Passover lamb on our behalf. So the Passover pointed toward Jesus. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians that Christ was our Passover. 1 Corinthians 5, 7 says, clean out the old leaven so that you may be a new unleavened batch as indeed you are. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Now you notice this verse references not just Christ as the Passover lamb, but also mentions unleavened bread. Now, that's the second feast that we would find, the Feast of Unleavened Bread in Exodus 12. Also celebrated as it's part of that Passover period, following immediately after the Passover, lasting one week. The Israelites, for this feast, they would eat no bread with yeast. And that was done, it was, they're told to do it, and remembering their haste in preparing for their exodus from Egypt. Again, that's don't eat leavened bread, not exactly what we would consider a feast, right? It's, It's an appointed time in which they would keep this tradition. Leaven was also considered a symbol for sin. And we see then, as this points to and shows us something about Jesus, that Jesus' life was completely unleavened. 1 Corinthians 5.8 says, Therefore let us observe the feast, not with old leaven or with the leaven of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Because of Christ, our leaven has been taken away. We're a new loaf, we're a new life in Him. Next, we see the Feast of First Fruits, celebrated the first Sunday after Passover. It was celebrated after Passover. An Israelite would bring a sheaf of the first grain of the harvest, they'd bring it to the priest, and it would be waved to the Lord as an offering. This was to acknowledge that God delivered them from Egypt, but then gave them, brought them to the promised land. 1 Corinthians 15, 20 says, But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. So as God delivered Israel from slavery in Egypt and brought them to a promised land, we see that the Feast of First Fruits also pointed us to Christ who delivered us from slavery and brings us to eternal life and promised kingdom. Amen? So that would cover spring. Now we begin to move into fall. And we would actually see the Feast of Weeks. Oh, sorry, Feast of Weeks is still here with us. Feast of Weeks, then we'll get into the fall. Feast of Weeks, or feast we would think of as at the time of, or called Pentecost. Should also be pretty familiar to some of us who know our book of Acts. Celebrated 50 days later, required the offering of two loaves. Again, the primary focus of this festival would be gratitude to God for the harvest. And what is a wonderful harvest that happens at Pentecost in the New Testament. Jesus tells the disciples to wait until Pentecost. And Acts 2 tells us when the day of Pentecost had come, they were all with one accord in one place, and in the upper room, God poured out His Holy Spirit on those who were present. That's the beginning of the church. Then we move into the fall. We got the fall feasts. We got the Feast of Trumpets, first feast celebrated in the fall. Nothing like a good horn section. So the Lord spoke to Moses in Leviticus 23, says, In the seventh month, on the first day of the month, you shall have a Sabbath rest, a memorial of blowing the trumpets, a holy convocation. We'll come back to that word convocation in a minute. Now, many Bible teachers believe that this feast points to and will be fulfilled with the second coming of Christ. Right, 1 Thessalonians, for the Lord Himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. 1 Corinthians 15 says, in, the, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we will be changed. Amen? A feast of atonement would then occur shortly after the feast of trumpets. It says, on that day the priest shall make atonement for you to cleanse you, that you may be clean from all your sins before the Lord. Now, we, we can see, we could see this in a couple of different ways. We could, as Christians, say this has been fulfilled in the atoning work of Jesus Christ. But some would point and say, like, there's also still future. Many believe this feast 
will be fulfilled when Christ returns as King of kings, right? The trumpet will sound, and the one who has secured our atonement will come again in glory. So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly wait for Him, He will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. It's in Hebrews 9, verse 28. It's an aspect of now and not yet. And then there's the Feast of Booths, or the Feast of Tabernacles, if you will. In the seventh and five, that for seven days the Israelites would present offerings to the Lord, and they would live in huts made of palm branches, had to basically to recall and commemorate their sojourn as, as sojourners through the, through the desert, through the wilderness, prior to taking the land of promise. So it's a reminder of their temporary tents. We think this could, and make, making them grateful for the promised land provided. So it's also a reminder of our temporary tents, right? This body, temporary tent. And also it's a reminder of the incarnation of Christ. Right? Literally, He's Emmanuel, God with us. He tabernacles with us. He dwells with us. It also points forward to that future then. I mean, we will, tabern- we will be with Him in a promised land, new heaven and new earth. For the rest of eternity, people from every tribe, tongue, and nation will tabernacle or dwell with Christ in the new Jerusalem. It says these seven feasts were kept by God's people. And while we don't, we just did several weeks on our Sunday mornings going through what's our relationship to the law of Moses and and why why are we, we keep the morals, but things like the ceremonial, judicial things have sort of fallen away. We've been talking about that. That's its own whole other sermon too. But if we're not literally keeping these feasts and festivals, then what can we draw from Scripture in terms of aims of biblical feasting? Then we literally have a chance to do it today. And we got the holidays coming up, right? Maybe Thanksgiving needs an extra component. And maybe it's not even practical, maybe just in heart and mind. But what are seven aims of biblical feasting? The first one is obvious. Consumption, right? We eat. I mean, Jesus, I mean, Jesus quotes Scripture. He says, man shall not live by bread alone. That does assume we have food. It's like, not bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord. That doesn't, but guess what's included in that? Not bread alone, but I need, I need food. We see in Genesis that God gives, first we see the giving of vegetables. We see after Noah the giving of animals. All these, the, I'm giving these things to you as food. Notice, always have to remember that, no matter where we got it, from the store or from the chicken we had in our own backyard, like all these things are given, not gleaned. Before I even eat, like these things have been furnished to me, not found by James, not gleaned by the Harleman household. All these things have been given since creation, God created them, made man, it's like, I'm giving you this as food. I'm giving you this as food. Anytime I sit down and look at my food, it's like this was given. And even I might thank the human hands that gave it that day. But do I remember in my heart that it was given by God? To me, to everyone. I don't want to neglect the fact. I mean, just the fact that we eat, the fact that we put it into our bodies, that, that is an acceptable first aim. But another aim of biblical feasting then is we would see commemoration. We see this with the Passover. We see that they would take, they have these feasts of seven days. Like what, so commemoration is a huge part. We see that throughout the feasts and festivals kept by the Israelites. Next we would see celebration. I'm not just commemorating something as if this happened. Right? There is gratefulness. There is thankfulness. And in feasting, which I suppose you could have a feast prepared, like that king in Lord of the Rings that just sits and eats it all to himself, and just grotesque without utensils, right? Some of you remember that scene. Never seen somebody eat so angrily. But there's an aspect then, usually feasting is with somebody, Right? It's comradeship. And it's usually, it's when, when it is especially wonderful is when it is more than just a technical neighbor. 
and maybe even just more than just someone you could call acquaintance or friend. It takes on its best dimension when it is truly a comrade on mission together, when it's being eaten with someone that you actually share not just relation but direction. That we're, we are in some way we're one household, one house, one family, praying together, thanking God and commemorating that aspect of friendship as well. Next then we would see contentment. Right? It's a reminder of all of the things that have been provided. It's a reminder of everything around you. It's a reminder of just the simple fact that you can sit down with both the foods or the persons. And scripture tells us that like, if we have food and drink, we have the clothes, with these things, we can be content. We are content. Look at all you've provided, God. But then we get to the word convocation. Convocation. It's the one we probably don't have on the tip of our tongues. All those, a lot of these others, yes. They all start with C. I know, it's a pastor's device. Convocation, if, we look, if you look at it, it says summoned assembly. Well, guess what we're doing today? A holy convocation, so it is a set apart, special, established assembly. The holy convocations commanded in the Mosaic law were held on special religious days. I mean, it was a required gathering of God's people. So you might say instead of holy convocations, some translations will say sacred assemblies, a set-apart assembly, a sacred assembly. For it to be a biblical feast, it needs to be set apart. It needs to look, it should look in some manner, way, shape, or form different from the world. Again, the world can pretty much do one through five. They can eat, commemorate something, celebrate something, even have some people that are more than friends but kind of have shared workmates, shared partnerships of some kind, and they could even be content. How is it set apart? How do you set apart your feast? How do you set apart every meal? Because let's face it, compared to humanity throughout history, most of our normal meals are feasts compared to what many would be looking forward to. Every time you sit down to anything that you could call a a fairly nice spread, what is a way that we make it a holy convocation? A simple way would be begin with prayer, right? I say you grow up, I say, well, do do we do I have to pray before a meal? Is something wrong with the food if I don't pray? Is it not blessed? Am I gonna choke on it? Now Christians have an odd Chris. Christians who don't want to be legalistic often bristle when anything seems like it's routine or expected or regular. But how, what's a simple way, either before or after or both or during, that our feasts can be holy convocations? Well, they can be bathed in prayer, bathed in recognition of the other presence in the room, not an elephant. God is with us. God is present. And with a biblical feast, hopefully there is also contemplation. By contemplation, that's contemplating the future. I was going to put expectation, but it didn't start with C. Expectation is probably the better word. And in this case, the great expectation. Every time, every time I have a feast, my aim should be at some point to think about Revelation 19. It says, blessed are those invited to the marriage feast of the Lamb. Revelation 3.20, Jesus is talking to the churches, churches that have lost their luster or lost their love or having problems. He says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. Right? Breaking bread together, feasting with the Lord, not just for the Lord, but with Christ. There should be a great expectation as we have any enjoyable meal as a Christian. My mind should go that I can think of no better way than to begin with prayer and at some point connect that foretaste. As I'm tasting food, there's something more should happen. I should have a foretaste of the feast but beyond feasts beyond any feast that we'll ever have here. We get a glimpse 
of that in Isaiah 25. It says, on this mountain, the Lord of armies will prepare for all the peoples a feast of choice meat, a feast with aged wine, prime cuts of choice meat, fine vintage wine. On this mountain, he will swallow up the burial shroud, the shroud over all peoples, the sheet covering all the nations. When he has swallowed up death once and for all, the Lord will wipe away the tears from every face and remove his people's disgrace from the whole earth. For the Lord has spoken, and on that day it will be said, look, this is our God. We've waited for him. And he has saved us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. Let's rejoice and be glad in his salvation. Amen? So some things to ask as we are eating, as we are feasting, not just today, but perhaps we hit the holidays this year, we transform some of our meal times, maybe our household times around the dinner table. Sit down to eat. What am I commemorating? What am I commemorating with this feast? What am I truly commemorating and what am I celebrating? Who are my comrades? As we look down at it, we ask, God, am I content? Am I content? I can ask, is this meal set apart? Am I scarfing it down with no thought, no gratitude, no care? Nothing that sets it apart from the way the world feasts or even just eats breakfast. And what am I looking forward to? And part of the fact that we have to eat generally to be healthy once or more than once per day, I can't, we can't help but think God designed us that way and then placed some of these things in His holy order so we would have multiple times each day to ask and connect to some of these things. If we're thankful to our God, then really every meal we have between now and the feast at His banquet table really is and can be a feast. Amen? So let's take time, maybe ask those questions today as, as we head out and begin to enjoy a meal prepared by hands. We can enjoy the one who provided it first and foremost, who provided the comradeship we have here, the community that we have here, the relationships. We can commemorate if we're here because Jesus has paid the price for our sin, amen? And we can look forward to the expectation at the great feast we'll have with him, of which today can just be a tiny shadow, a tiny copy in Jesus' name. Let's pray. Father, we thank you this morning. We offer thanks for the time of worship that you've given us, for the time of meal and friendship and fellowship we have before us, for the fact that you made this day and by your grace even had the sun shine down for us to have our time together. God, as we step out into the creation you've made, Enjoy the food that you have given. Enjoy the family you have placed around us. And enjoy these times. Pray that you will transform this and every feast. That in every way we know that we are the family of God. And that Jesus is that Lord and Savior. We pray all this in your precious name. Amen.